Hello and welcome to episode 19 of Building Our World with me, Alex Bloisey. Now this week I was joined by Nicholas Kipp, who is one of the co-founders at Banksware in Berlin. Now I wanted to get Nicholas on the show because basically in the last 18 months of his life, he's transitioned from being really high up in a consulting company to then going to freelance on the side this new Banksware project to eventually going full time with the business and joining the founding team. So we really explore these last 18 months, digging into the highs, the lows, and getting some insights from this period of immense change in his life, touching on topics of cognitive diversity, team formation, sales, and trying to delve a bit deeper as well into his own personal motivations to why he has done this. Nicholas is clearly an interesting and switched on person. So if there's anyone who's also early on in their founding journey or looking to make the step to being a co-founder, then I'd really encourage you to listen to this week's episode. Nicholas is really generous with his learnings. So without further ado, let's get this episode started. How has the last 18 months of your life been how could you sort of sum it up so uh, over the last 18 months obviously um, we started this journey with building the company of banksware um, and for the first i must say six to nine months of that um, i did that in parallel to my full-time management job at the previous uh, fintech company so uh, you can imagine that it was a lot of balancing to two jobs at the same time for the for the first time um, and then now since January I'm full-time on this and it feels much better overall and if I especially compare to, to my previous life as a um, hired um, manager executive in, in a more established company I must say that startup life is definitely super exciting and has been a lot of fun um, but it's also much more demanding. So there's m many more ups and downs than in, in a more steady corporate job, I would say. Um, and at the same time, I really enjoy this hands-on attitude of, of getting things done and working directly with the customers, which in larger organization often often gets lost and you work more on, on politics, on, on management, overhead, PowerPoint, that kind of stuff. Mm. Whereas here... Really, every day I'm talking to our customers, um, checking our loans, and then that kind of hands-on stuff really suits me well. So that corporate life is it? Is it really the stereotype of uh, of what people say? Like a lot of politics, especially in um, uh, that you were sort of at sea level, were you chief risk officer. Yes. Yeah. So. I mean, I must say the, the last company I worked at as, as a chief risk officer, it was definitely okay. It was still a rather small and, and lean company where there wasn't too much of that management worship. But as we um, were acquired by private equity, um, more and more of that crept in. But especially looking at the jobs I had even before that, where I worked mostly in, in large stock exchange listed companies like DHL, um, Definitely a lot of the, the rumors are true. Um, and I think especially from an outsider's perspective, a lot of stuff that is done in the day-to-day -day doesn't make so much sense. Obviously, when you're in it, it feels super urgent and you really need to get that PowerPoint done by midnight and you're working long hours and really stress yourself out, especially in a, in a management position. Mm. But then in the grand scheme of things, in the end, what value does it bring for, for the customer um, for the investor or for your team members. Um, whereas I feel in, in small organizations, you have a lot more of that direct impact um, that gives yeah. you instant feedback and gratification as well. Yeah. I have a few friends who work in like investment banking. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially when they were like junior, they said they worked crazy hours on stuff that just didn't matter, like editing a slide deck on a PowerPoint or like formatting <laughs> like a pie chart and it was like never used and it was just completely pointless and the yeah. lack of traction between it's sort of in the productivity between the output and what actually 
makes the impact is is so low. Yeah, my my favorite anecdote is always when back as a student, I worked in a one of the major um, strategy consultancies, um, and I was working on a on a rather large slide deck at three thirty in the morning, and then my manager pointed me toward the footnotes and that they were not super straight and sometimes jumping. <laughs> and then I really I thought, why am I doing this? This was for, for reference a PowerPoint that was never shown to anyone in the end. Yeah. And then the next day uh, they had this evaluation meeting and wanted me to come in full time and asked me like, we have the feeling this job is not like, doesn't really bring you a lot of joy. And I just looked at him and thought, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, but it's interesting that people get so, um, I don't know, impressed by the money and the perks that obviously such a job brings that they don't even think so much about what in the end really matters and what value it brings. Mm. So coming on to that, obviously it is, it has its perks, it has its upsides. So whilst you were you were in this role, how did your involvement um, in banks where come around yeah so banksware is is a pretty young company that was initially founded by by two of my co-founders miriam and jens who had the idea um just coming from their deep understanding of the market where they thought um that handing out loans via platforms is something that that is no one doing yet in, in most European markets. Um, and that really serves a greater purpose because a lot of the SMEs that we are targeting, the small and medium companies, they don't really have access to, to cash. So they rather quickly put together the idea and the concept of the company and then approached me at some point um, and sort of because I worked with the ends for, for a longer time, um, he asked me whether I could support on risk management and underwriting and all the Involving complicated stuff like banking regulation and compliance and so on. So I came on as a, as a freelancer, just working on the weekends a bit. Um, obviously, asked my my employer for permission first, and mm -hmm. then um, after some time, it really developed nicely. And then I decided, okay, now is the time. This is an awesome team where I can directly join as a co-founder um, and and really have that impact that I, I wanted to have. And then decided to make the jump. And then obviously it always takes time to to phase out of a of a management position because this yeah. is not a job that you just leave and two weeks later you're gone. It's obviously a longer process of handing over, building up your successor, um, enabling the teams to perform without you. Um, but I went along that journey and then after a further six months approximately, um, finally was able to, to make the switch knowing that I didn't leave a mess behind, but everything was sorted out and had a really mm. amazing success in place. Mm. How long did it take you to wind down your management role? About six months, I would say, yeah. Um, I mean, I had the benefit of working in a rather higher management position where I wasn't doing a lot of stuff myself, but there were like two levels of management like beneath me and and this team was so amazing that they really took care of, of everything day to day, but still it, it takes some time to hand over yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. So when you were like freelancing on, on the side mm -hmm. for, for the banks where, how did, did they come to you and said like, we, we want you as a co-founder or did, how did that sort of develop? Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, in the end, it's it's a conversation and we discussed like what would be a good setup to build this company. At that point, there was nothing except for a PowerPoint idea um, and, and a few uh, euro to, to get started. Um, and then we discussed options. And in the end, we, we looked at each other and said, okay, so if we need this kind of person in the team, um, who could that be? <laughs> and then... Uh, I myself, uh, yeah, realized that that uh, it would really be a good fit for me. Um, mm. Yeah, and then we made that happen. I know each each founder obviously brings their own unique set of skills. Yeah, and I think that's something that's often often disregarded. So oftentimes, at least if you look at the European startup scene, you see teams that are rather homogenous and and just I don't know three guys out of university and and we really wanted to build a diverse team so we have Miriam as, as one of the 
most well-known fintech female founders in Germany, actually. Um, and she never finished university studies, for example. So really, she's really very much sales and marketing driven, really understands the market. And with the ends, we have a really established lawyer who really understands sort of the the strategy of, of uh, yeah, building a company and getting investors. We have me more of the, the regulatory and, and data and, and banking side. So I'm sort of the, the tie and suits guy in the team, <laughs> even though I don't really feel like that. And then we we brought in uh, two more people. So Fabian, so our chief product officer, he's sort of the, the nitty gritty, uh, getting things done, just starting building a product and directly going into coding and, and um, getting the first iteration out there in a few days kind of guys. So really hands-on, fast delivery. And Yogo, our CTO who joined from Klarna, um, knew about how to scale this up and, and bring it to a larger scale. And I mean, this just as an example shows you that we think it's important to mix not only different genders and nationalities, but also different like ways of thinking and sort of more mm. high level and detail oriented, more more extra, more specific, more rational, more creative. These kind of dimensions really need to more be filled out in order to to arrive at a well functioning, well rounded team. Mm. Yeah, cognitive diversity is. Yeah, that's exactly is, the, the is, uh, academia uh, term for that. Yeah, yeah, is is absolutely. Um, integral to a company now and i think it's definitely gone into the mainstream there's definitely been a few books um on it as well that have got really popular but you're, you're so right and um i've been doing a, a lot of work with companies just on obviously on the recruiting side on their like diversity equity and inclusion um I'm speaking to people on this podcast who are sort of specialists within that and it's not just a case of you know we just want to get people from different backgrounds just to be sort of more inclusive. Obviously that's a huge part of it and definitely the right thing to do, but it actually makes your business better and it, it makes your, um, your growth plans in place uh, a lot more. And I remember in, in a lot of companies, uh, I know a lot of, obviously a lot of recruiting agencies and a lot of like the director team or the management team are just sort of, you know, middle class sort of white male wealthy and they will just sit in a room i don't know whether it's like this in big companies in germany but you will just sit in a room and they all agree with each other they all say yes to their amazing ideas and, and tell each other how good they are and uh it's a massive problem i think but the the companies that are embracing that sort of diversity is will, will definitely get ahead yeah definitely so in terms of like the practical side like you're coming into this role you obviously have your role as like a co-founder and your your niche but i obviously see like a lot of job titles like strat chief strategy officer chief risk officer head of strategy like what <laughs> does that actually mean <laughs> yeah, i think there's two sides to that so a i think as in every functioning team be it a founder team or a normal team in the company you have your your specializations your niches so for example in our team i'm responsible for the relationship to banking partners um, for risk management underwriting operations so also customer service that kind of stuff but i think at the same time in such a young company it's also important that everybody understands that they all expect it to pitch in and these clear-cut boundaries do not really exist so in my day-to-day I would say even though my, my formal role would be to take care of the, the underwriting and the customer service mainly, I spend probably a third of time actually in sales, just working with Miriam and her pretty amazing team to talk to customers and really understand their needs and, and try to bring value to them. Um, or another example, we are a rather young company, so we, at the moment we are only 18, 19 people, so we don't have an HR function yet. So I also spend a lot of time doing recruiting myself and in the end doing what you are doing professionally, rather um, naively trying to reach out on LinkedIn to potential mm. um, join us to the team and doing interviews and um, taking care of, of payroll with, with our colleagues, that kind of stuff. Mm. Is that, say, for example, the sales part, did you ever do that in your previous role? Is that completely new to you now? I, yeah, 
I, I did um, not not really professionally, but but I um, definitely had that as part of my job as well. It's an interesting thing. I, I have this sales approach um, because I'm I'm like formally, and if you look at the regulation, I'm I'm not supposed to sell to customers, so I'm on the like back office side, not the, the front mm-hmm. office. Um, and that actually works really well as a sales trick when you talk to to customers and you tell them. So my job is not in sales. I'm not gonna try to convince you to buy from us i'm just gonna try to like explain the truth and uh, how to make our product better and go into the complicated details that maybe a sales manager uh, cannot represent and that works rather nicely because on the other side with the client you also have your risk and compliance and legal and finance and treasury people and they usually understand people like me better and the, the flashy sales colleague that, mm. I don't know, just wants to to realize their bonus and, and really uh, tries to convince them and tells them everything they want to hear, which is mm. not really what we do in our company anyways. But um, I, I found that this kind of sales works, works uh, overall quite well. Mm. I think um, as a founder, you're always selling, aren't you? Whether Definitely. you're explaining uh, the legal sort of intricacies or doing a full-on, yeah. a full-on pitch. And even like people will, will want to know that they're if they are speaking to a regulatory sort of expert, then um, you know they want to be safe in the knowledge that if they go with your product that, that they're in good hands. So it all adds up. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're totally right, and definitely true that any founder position involves a lot of hustling, and regardless of your exact position, you are never leaving the sales pitch mode be it talking to investors potential hires or even on the street like in our current product we we are offering restaurants to uh, loans to restaurants so you can imagine in every lunch break we go to our to the restaurants in the area and try to understand their needs and try to convince them uh, to work with us as well so you're never really leaving this this hustle mode Mm. how has it affected your work-life balance being a founder compared to your previous job? So not not as bad as I thought, actually, because uh, even before, I mean, whether I was in strategy consultancy or in senior management, I always worked long hours. Um, I must say that now it is not more relaxed, but it's, it does offer more flexibility in a young company where you can... Uh, fit your hours more around your your personal life as well um but overall i think one thing that that one has to be aware of that this mode of always being on always being selling always taking care of the company that never leaves you and even if you are on the weekend or on vacation i mean if an investor calls if it's your company, you will still pick up the phone and you won't tell them, hey, I'm on vacation, please call, uh, I don't know, my uh, colleague. But it's your baby, so you will always be there for it. I think that has to be something that one is aware of before going on this journey. But I also feel it's much more rewarding than doing that for for a company that's not your yours. Mm. How would you compare your productivity now as a founder than in your previous job? Right now, as we are still in this rather early stage, I think it's really high because everything we are doing in the end leads to either customer benefit um, or building the company. And there's much less overhead and and bullshit stuff involved. Mm. And so, I mean, you're never at 100%, but I think it is, it's much higher. On the other hand, it also requires much more prioritization because we have way less resources. The team is much smaller. So we really need to think about, like, do I invest now into this customer proposal or the other one? Which one is more likely to really bring value to the customer? Um, same when you talk to investors, like with a young company, at least in our company, there was a case we get so many inbound requests from or kind of media people that want to talk to you and potential investors, potential customers, applicants, and you really need to select a bit who's really a fit and is going to bring us forward and who just wants to 
get insights and I don't know, copy it or it's just curious. Mm. Um, that has become more important than before. Mm. Do you make those decisions on like who's going to benefit us in the short term as well as the long term? Is that because uh, coming it from sort of my side, obviously I sp- I speak to potential clients and I work with clients as well. And there's some clients I work with where I think, okay, for, for my business, this company will probably not make me, uh, will make the company a lot of money in the next sort of three, six months, but they're a young company. And if I do a good job now and partner with them and get to know them and they grow in the years to come, they could be a really kind of long worthwhile partner. Um, so it's always balancing the needs between the short and the long term. I don't know if that's something that comes into your thinking at all when you're dealing with these requests and potential Yeah, def- definitely. And that is, so I think it's one of the the things we really try to avoid to say no to potential opportunities that are small now and will grow later on. And I think what we rather try to do is to say no to those that will never work with us. And what I found is less making that decision in in the like office myself or with the team, but rather talk to the applicant or the the customer or like the potential investor and really tell them, hey, really appreciate your interest now that we've gotten to know each other. Do you really think this is something that we both can commit to? Or are you not sure yet? And then maybe let's rather talk in six months down the line. And that has worked quite well, especially with applicants, to be honest, because for some time I spent a lot of time talking to potential team members along the funnel. And then at the last step, they told me like, yeah, but the salary is not what they want. Um, or they didn't feel like moving to Berlin after all. So now I always have a sh- really short, like 15 minutes call just in the beginning where I tell them, okay, tell me exactly what you need, what you want. And I'm going to tell you really honestly what we expect and what we cannot deliver. And then if we both think this might actually work, then we will go into the process of, our, I don't know, standard two to five interviews, depending on the role but then really saves a lot of effort. And we try to do the same in our sales funnel where it's always worthwhile having a first meeting, but then I think very quickly one needs to decide whether it's worthwhile continuing or just say, okay, let's meet for a beer sometime, but we don't need to waste huge organization resources just for the sake of it. Yeah, absolutely. With that recruiting um, sort of anecdote you tell, that is, is so true. It's always better to... The temptation is, especially when you first start, is to just sort of fill fill the pipeline up and kind of see what happens. Um, but that first call, almost just like sh- shutting the doors um, of potential things that could go wrong along the process is like so valuable. Uh, like when I'm, say, for example, I, I speak to people who want to relocate to Germany and, you know, they're like, yeah, I've spoken with my... Um, with my family, like my partner, and then like, are you married or unmarried? They're like, oh no, we're not married. And I was like, okay, so have you looked into how you sh- that you know they won't be able to get a, a blue card because just because you get one? Like, oh no, but we'll work it out. We'll work it out. No, you, you need to work it out now. I'll send you the information. Get back to me with how your sort of sort of strategy and like little things like that because the last thing you want to do is is put out an offer and everything's okay apart from kind of their, their life situation. Um, and it's the same in, in sales as well. Obviously I always use recruiting as an example because that's yeah. all I know about. <laughs> no, it's a good, it's a good one. And uh, really speaks to, to your work ethic because especially when you work with uh, a lot of the larger recruiters, I find that they often don't take care of that. And then often you find out later on a candidate was just chopping around and last mm. minute they go to their current employer and uh, just increase the salary with your offer, which in the end, you not only lose a lot of time, but you also like shut the door for other potential hires because you th- yeah. thought you had a good candidate. Yeah. The worst is, and, yeah, and again, the, the counter offer thing is very common. Every company is basically doing it, but having that, conversation on the first call because if if i speak to a candidate and they're like yeah i mean i just want to kind of salary increase uh sort of money and that's kind of their main motivation it's always a bit of a red flag because 
if they get a 5k counter offer then they're just staying so <laughs> yeah. it's always got to be more so i suppose in your situation it would have to be you know working with candidates who really want to join uh a company early on their journey exactly really kind of build and, and make an impact and that's sort of your usp i suppose from a, from a candidate point of view but anyway um we won't get into the, the nitty gritties of, <laughs> of recruitment um I mean, how, as a new founder as well, you said, you mentioned it's your baby, but how are you like switching off? I know obviously you're very experienced anyway, but I started my business last year and the first three months in terms of my sort of workload and my routine was just absolutely pure chaos. Just all the time. Some bits were effective, some bits weren't, and the adjustment for me was, um, you know, quite a, quite a big one. So, how how have you found it? Is it something that's come a bit more sort of naturally to you, or have you had to sort of work on that sort of switching off and, and the routine around, you know, essentially working for yourself? Yeah, I think it's it's probably even harder if you are sort of on your own as we really quickly started building a, a true company around this with a, like an office and, and people. And so a lot of the software that supports you like, like Slack and, and like daily standups and working in Scrum and so on. Um, I think that was a bit easier than if you were just fighting for yourself uh, for, for a longer time. On the other hand, I must confess that I still find it difficult to switch off. I don't for me personally, it's not more difficult now than it was before, but it's something that in in any kind of job, I think that demands a lot of your your mental energy and and like capacity working with teams and and like figuring out new solutions. It's just more difficult to switch off as opposed to, I don't know, working on, on a construction project and then coming home, especially now with COVID, COVID obviously, where all of us are mostly working from home. Um, so I'm, I'm still trying out new stuff. Um, as for many people, I personally find sports helps a lot, uh, any kind of routine that allows you to wind down. And then uh, obviously a, uh, a partner that understands the challenge and, and where maybe you can team up and find a solution together that's also mm. really valuable. But I uh, haven't find the, found the secret uh, recipe and uh, to be honest, don't believe anyone that says they have. Mm. Yeah, I don't believe many people have either. <laughs> but you, um, obviously in terms of like your whole career, like you've worked hard, you've worked long hours, you've worked your way up in the corporate world and now started on this journey um that's a pretty unique profile and a pretty unique journey so i suppose i'd love to know what really has driven that um there's plenty of other paths you could have taken in life um easier paths as well so what has driven you to go on that journey yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think it's somewhat an inherent drive for for always taking the next step, and and I'm must admit I'm getting bored rather easily um, with uh, steady situations. Um, so I I think in any job every few months I, I was talking to my superior always like how can I get more responsibility where else can can I develop what stuff can I learn in addition um, this kind of hunger for for more has driven me it's it's not really about money actually at some points I actively decided to take steps that were made significantly less especially after a background in consultancy or you mentioned investment banking where it's even more more prominent um, that you can you will never earn more money than in those kind of positions um, but it's really the the drive for something else and personal growth and um, so I every every year every five years I, I make sort of a plan what else do I want to learn what areas do I want to develop into and then rather 
aggressively, I must say, um, try to get there as quickly as possible. And I can't even say why. It's just a, a personal um, drive that is there. I think it's true for, for a lot of people. Um, yeah. Has that always been there, like even through education and school? For me, definitely, yes. Very early on, uh, since I joined, joined school um, as, as a young child, I was, I mean, best back then it was uh, always having the best grades. And uh, then later on, it was less about the numbers and more about learning new stuff and understanding more and, and um, just discovering additional aspects of uh, additional business models, additional companies. Mm. It's stuff like that in terms of work ethic and drive and the directions you want to take. I was having a conversation with someone the other day. He's just had, he's got two like really young kids and he always kind of thought that it was sort of nurture in the environment you grew up in. That's going to, you know, instill work ethic in you and, and drive and things like that. And obviously that's true to a point, but it's, I, I personally think it's, it's like genetic. It's just a, almost like a personality trait that, a lot of people can't change. Yeah, maybe. To to be honest, I I don't know. Um, maybe it's genetics. Maybe it's also something deeply rooted in the psychology of people. Um, I also believe it changes over the lifetime. So you mentioned kids. So I don't have any kids. I do know of, of a lot of friends where these priorities obviously changed once they started their own family. Totally understandable. Um, but yeah, I think like if, if, if this is something that drives you, why not go for it? If at the same time, like if a different person is not motivated by this, it's also super fair to pursue other, other roads and stay on a steady position or optimize for income or optimize for free time. Um, I personally only always like if people are transparent about what they want. And coming back to the example of, of recruiting or even more relevant uh, people leadership, this is something that I also, also talk to like my, my team members always and ask them like, what is driving you personally? Like, what is it where you want to go? And in, I have worked with amazing team members that told me really early on, listen, Nicholas, this is just a job for me. I need the money, but my my heart is somewhere else, like my passion is my music career or my children or whatever, then that's fine and I can support them in that. And if someone else tells me, hey, Nicholas, I'm like, I really want to get there. My dream goal is to be a, I don't know, senior data scientist uh, studying earthquakes, whatever. But right now I didn't even make a university, then I can <laughs> try to support them in that journey. I think it's it's always cool to have sort of this direction where you want to go and be vocal about it. And and once you are vocal about it, you talk about it, then you will find people that support you in that journey. Mm. I think that's a super, super healthy way of approaching it. Um, it's almost like it's always a deal, isn't it? Employment, the business has to get something from it and the employee has to get something from being in the job. And if you strike that balance, then it's a successful uh, partnership. What a big mistake I think a lot of founders make uh, at times across whatever domain is that they think that their employees care, a mu care as much about the business as the founders do, which is obviously never going to happen. And they think that it's kind of going to, they will live and die for the company and then get the shock of their life when <laughs> they hand their notice in. Um, so I think having that understanding and and you manage someone so much better when you really kind of know their motivations and you can manage their workload and their responsibilities in so much more effective way. Yeah, exactly. I think you're totally right there. Um, I think it's two mistakes that are often being made. One is the one you mentioned um, in general, assuming that everyone is driven the way you are. And, and has the same motives. The other one is not being transparent about your own motives. And oftentimes, especially young young companies, they promise the world to, to employees or applicants and tell them like, 
I don't know, we, we are going to offer you this career and you will have the, the best opportunities ever and you will always be rich. And then um, they, they just don't deliver on that one. And then often what you see is then in the media that like a large chunk of people suddenly leave or the values don't align anymore. Or I don't know, there's a conflict with the uh, workers' union. Whereas I was always advocate for really being transparent. And if you just need someone that gets shitty stuff done and and works in um i don't know bad legacy processes because right now you don't have the funds to automate stuff then tell that people and tell them hey this is the job this is all i can offer right now um at the same time maybe we we find uh, something on the side for you to develop into or you just tell them it is what it is and you look for people that are fine with that and just um, where it aligns with their values of maybe, I don't know, uh, just getting money for, for their private life or whatever, um, getting an entry into the, the ecosystem. And then you will find people where, where you really have a fit. Mm. Have you ever had trouble with almost trying to get people's motivations out of them, like truthfully? Um, I don't know whether it's a problem in sort of your sort of field, but I used to, my old, old company, it was uh, like a bigger agency. And obviously a lot of people get into agency recruitment uh, for like the commission and in the UK agency industry, like trips to sort of Barbados and big expensive lunches are like sort of the perks. It's like incentive based, like target based, like sales targets essentially. Um, and I think, a lot of grads would, I would interview a lot of grads and they would tell me, they would say, yeah, money is absolutely my number one motivation. And, you know, I want to do this and I want to do that. And I want to be really rich and live in a big house, which is like, obviously great. And then you kind of get into the job and then their real motivations weren't at sort of like that level, which again is absolutely fine. But I don't know if you've ever had any, any issues with really trying to dig out people's motivations and why they want to be there and, and what they want to do. Yeah. So, sometimes I did. Um, and then most often what I, what we together found out after a few discussions is that maybe they didn't know yet what, what really drives them. And I saw that a lot with people out of university or at a sort of breaking point in their life. I don't know, after maybe, um, they started a family, a, a, a partnership failed, and, and they were sort of at this breaking point and reorienting themselves. I think that's also fine, um, and, and one can only uh, respect that and give them the time. It just makes a few things much harder. So mm. um, people development and career options, I mean, how can you provide that as a company if you don't know where someone wants to go and whether they want to move in a certain direction or not? Um, so we usually just like gave them time and then over time figured together out what, what a good path for them would be. Or whether it's just mm. staying at a position, which is always also fine. Um, but oftentimes these people are also, I found out, un unhappy and sort of restless trying to figure out where they want to go. Um, and there's only so much you can do as a company to support them in that. In the end, everyone else on their own needs to figure out what, what their journey in life is. Absolutely. Now, that brings me neatly on to your journey. So we've done a lot on sort of the past sort of year. If we're looking forward, um, and also the company's journey as well, is there like an end goal in place? Like how far do you plan ahead? Because I speak to some founders and they're like, our goal is to exit. Absolutely. And we want to do it by this year or whatever. How are you seeing your, your sort of life and your work develop over the next day, let's say 10 years? Yeah. So I must say we don't have this, this roadmap of, um, how exactly the company will develop over the years. Of course, we have a roadmap for the next, um, I don't know, 12 to 18 months. Um, but at this early stage, we are also very much working from month to month and quarter to quarter. And together with our investors, where we are very transparent, um, trying to figure out how is 
the product, the demand, and the market overall developing. And that's one of the beautiful things, but also the terrifying things about this company that we are sort of shaping the market. So a lot of what we're doing is also educating um, the the space about the opportunities we now offer. And now more and more competitors are also coming into Germany, mainly from UK and US. So um, it gets a bit more well-known, but it's, it's a lot of market education right now. And it's difficult okay. to sort of forecast when exactly we will hit what milestone uh, in like super long term. Personally, I'm like really enjoying the ride so far and, and thinking about this like every quarter, every every month, how, how can we bring this further and not thinking what will be in eight to 10 years. Obviously, we are all dreaming of this being a super big, super successful company. Um, mm. And uh, I'm super sure we will get there. But then exactly what financing form that will be whether it's uh, i don't know setting the company or ipoing or just staying independent uh, for a super long time that's not at the top of our minds mm. it's inter interesting what you say about how you're sort of educating the market and quite early i think uh, there's like quite a famous ted talk of what's the biggest factor for tech company success or company success and timing in the market was the biggest one. I think they gave an example of how um, like the equivalent of YouTube was started in like 2001, but it didn't work because the internet speeds weren't sort of good enough um, <laughs> and things like that. I think the famous example is like Airbnb where no one thought it would work, but then after like 2009, the recession, people wanted to make a bit of an extra income and they rented out a room in their, their home. Mm -hmm. and it, it definitely worked. So, um, it's interesting how you're sort of educating the market, but if you as a company can catch that almost that wind in your sails and sort of move with uh, the market moving, it um, could be a recipe for enormous success. Yeah, that's what we are hoping at least. <laughs> that's one thing I've definitely learned from like the past sort of 18 months with this whole pandemic. Like a year ago when I sort of started my business like the skills of recruitment and like talent acquisition for like the first half of 2020 weren't really like in demand mm -hmm. and I did a post about it on LinkedIn like last week because it was like the year anniversary and I've been really lucky that obviously the market has bounced back and now my skills are more in demand but it doesn't like whether the market went up or down doesn't make me a, a better or worse recruitment recruiter there's things that are outside of your control uh, that uh, don't define you as a person as well. I think that's been like my my biggest lesson from the massive down and the, the massive up from yeah. the pandemic. No, you're totally right that market timing and economic developments drive success. At the same time, I would also advocate against any founders being deterred by that. So, I mean... We found the banks were in the worst possible time in a global recession and pandemic where every bank closed down their loan books and like default rates were supposed to explode. Um, and we founded it in the most difficult market. So Germany in this specific business aspect of SME lending is really one of the most regulated EU countries and would have been so much easier to do it in Poland or Finland first, for example. But we thought, okay, if we manage to, to conquer this situation and this market now, then everything is going to be downhill afterwards. And I think mm -hmm. the same same is true for, for your business. Maybe it's not the easiest point in time to start, but it's also really rewarding if then you still can do it and um, then, then you know yeah. that you are set up for success ever after. Absolutely. It humbles you as well and it, it, Indeed. it, makes, it makes you... Like I'm so I'm, now I'm so glad like 2020 happened because I'd only ever worked in like kind of the boom times really in terms of after university and to know what a downturn feels like and to, to work through it um, infinitely more well equipped now for for the next storm and better at my job as well and I'm sure the same yeah same for companies started uh, last year so we'll we'll wrap up very soon. Yes. I wanted to ask you one last thing. So 
what's great is that you're kind of fresh into the journey and it's still sort of quite new in the grand scheme of things. But say, for example, there is uh, another Nicholas Kip at a bank or a consultancy or, or whatever, and they've stumbled across a particular idea or people who have got an idea um, and they're not sure whether to kind of take that jump. Is there anything you would you would say to them right now? I mean, in general, do it. I think um, being brave and and trying out um, your your personal journey, trying to fulfill your idea, um, definitely do that. The world needs more entrepreneurs. At the same time, um, I also would give a more specific hint of talking to as many people as possible about your idea. Just going out there, talking to to experts, to potential customers, potential investors. I don't know whether it's true for any country, but especially in Germany, I see so many potential founders who are really afraid of of talking about their idea, their finding, because they fear it might be stolen. And I mean, obviously that can happen, um, and no uh, complexity of NDA um, can can stop that from happening. But it's also not, the idea is not the critical point. The critical point is execution. And if you, only if you talk to people about it, can you find partners, investors, customers, and really figure out whether this is a journey that you want to go on to or not. Absolutely. Superb. Well, thank you so much for your wisdom, Nicholas. We will end <laughs> it there. Me, Alex. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was fun. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much for listening to the Building Our World podcast. I really hope you got some great value from it and enjoyed the conversation. If you are new to the series, then I do encourage you to take a look at the back catalogue. I've got some conversations with some of the brightest and best in Berlin tech. And if you want to stay up to date with future episodes, then please do hit that subscribe button and that follow button. It really helps me try and gain some traction with this series. But anyway, thank you so much for your time. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>